Hello, I'm Dominic Hobson, co-founder of Future of Finance. My guest today is Neil Thomas, Chief Commercial Officer of Asianext, a digital asset exchange owned by SBI Digital Holdings from Japan and Six Group, the Swiss Stock Exchange. The ambition of the Singapore-based digital asset exchange is to provide an institutional-grade platform for the listing, trading, clearing, settlement and custody of tokenized assets. Neil, thanks very much for joining us. Sorry, uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you for taking the time to speak to us. Could we begin with a quick review of, of the history of Asia Next? What's the story? Yeah, certainly. So um, Asia Next was originated back in, the, well, just before the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, actually. It was a, uh, the, Originally, they had the Swiss uh, Six Digital Exchange, uh, which was formerly out, out of Zurich uh, by the Swiss Exchange. Um, at the time, I was the um, head of APAC for the Six, uh, Swiss Exchange. And um, we saw that there was a real demand for uh, growing a demand in Asia for digital assets. And we looked to see how we, from the Six perspective, could grow that audience out of Asia. Um, and interestingly, myself and uh, the CRO of the Six Group met with SBI right before COVID uh, in March 2020, and we had a we had a conversation about how could we do something in Asia. Um, now, obviously, then COVID kicked in. There was a bit of a delay, um, and but the conversation kept going through uh, you know online channels. And back end of 2021, we formed a joint venture with uh, the Six Group and SBI. Digital Asset Holdings to form uh, Asia Next, um, which was to be a digital asset venue uh, trading a broad range of digital assets. Um, and then really 2022 was about the, at, at which time I was on the board, uh, was about really establishing the, the first hires, the team. Uh, and 2023 really was about the build up of the technology and onboarding our, our members that would help trade these assets. So. I sit here today, 2024, we're now live for part of that uh, under derivatives, but really the joint venture is two organizations who really were keen on spearheading the development of digital assets, not just in Asia, but globally. So that's how it came about. Well, you've talked about both SIX and, and SBI, and they obviously bring different things to, to, to the venture. But when you put those two forces together, what, what else do you get? Are we looking here at potentially a cross-border digital asset exchange in the in the medium to long term or are there different things which each party brings to the the party it's a good question i think both um so i think with the two organizations they kind of have different value uh, you know different sort of bring different type of value to the partnership so six is very much you know innovating in the dig digital security space and have been a pioneer uh, in switzerland um Six is really founded on you know, good principles of good governance, risk, and compliance. They're very well respected within as the financial markets infrastructure of Switzerland and now of, of the Spanish market as well. Um, SBI, on the other hand, of you know big players in the Japan market, but they're also really um, innovative and they are they are very much investors into the digital asset space. So they have quite a broad range of assets. So combining the kind of the the reputational um, infrastructure that the Swiss have alongside this innovative and investor style approach of SBI, you kind of bring together two different skill sets, which really lend to driving what Asia Next is developing. Um, as you rightly say, also from a global perspective, you know, we have Asia Next is founded in, in Singapore. Uh, you have six in Switzerland and Japan. Um, also, there's a, a ODX, Osaka Digital Exchange, um, which is um, and we have a long-term view to connect these three venues for digital securities in order to be able to transfer value uh, internationally. So yeah, that is part of the, uh, the plan going forward. Now, if we zoom back from the global to the local, uh, what is interesting about Singapore is it has been extraordinarily productive in producing digital asset exchanges. There's quite a few uh, in mm -hmm. Singapore. I just wonder how Asia Next would see itself as fitting into the spectrum of digital asset exchanges, if you like, in, in, in Singapore, both from a local point of view and maybe from a global point of view. How would you characterize your, your market position? 
Yeah, so um, you, yeah, you're right to point out there are some digital asset exchanges who are, who are also innovating in this space, and um, yeah, we we are yeah, understand their model very well. I think we're much we're quite broad um, in our approach. So we're not just in doing one thing. Um, you know, some of the players there are very much focused on private markets or looking at things like um, the uh, tokenization of real world assets. Uh, we, we're broad, so we also look at crypto uh, as an asset class, crypto derivatives, crypto spot, alongside security token offerings as well, uh, and real world assets. So we, we we actually operate under Asian X three exchanges: derivatives exchange, crypto spot exchange, and we have a, a, a recognised markets operator and a CMS license for um, the STO or securities exchange as well. So we we. I guess we're quite broad. We're, we're very there. We are rooted in Asia and in Singapore. We're global as well. So we're not just covering the local market. We're very much trying to approach global uh, adoption uh, in digital securities. So yeah, we understand what they're doing. Um, we do a bit of that, but we also do a lot more as well. You mentioned your CMS or Capital Market Services license, uh, and if I'm correct, you also have a, a regulated market operator license. Both of them obtained from the Monetary Authority in Singapore. Now, what do they uh, enable you to do in terms of asset classes? You've mentioned cryptocurrency spot and derivatives, but does this extend to this license extend to security tokens, uh, equities, bonds, and so on? And, and what sort of services do, do they cover as well? What, what can you do? Can you do all those things I mentioned at the outset, issuance, trading, settlement, custody, and so on? Yeah, no, no thanks. Um, so so you know, so what we can't do with the RMO CMS license is trade crypto spot, right? That's very much not a part of that. Um, the Payment Services Act, the DPT license that is available uh, from Monetary Authority of Singapore serves the crypto spot trading, and uh, we've applied for that license. We're just going through the the stages now with uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore, and we hope to secure that license uh, in a few months' time. So uh, that allows us. Crypto derivatives is we're an institutional only venue, so that is that is permitted but not licensed in Singapore. So the the RMO CMS license really allows us to trade digital securities and a collective investment schemes, so CIS based products such as funds ETFs. So we we can and real world assets. So we can use that for tokenization of real world um, assets or. You know, uh, fixed uh, assets uh, in tokenized form, as well as tokenized um, funds, uh, fixed income, etc. That all happens on on that venue. Uh, but that said, we look to leverage that venue for access to the other uh, exchanges as well. So, can we? You know, the, the interesting piece now is the recent announcement of the uh, Bitcoin ETF uh, launched by many um, major asset managers. That would sit on our RMO license um, platform, as, as an example. So, okay, so if I if I understand what you've just said correctly, you, you're starting with crypto derivatives, which is itself rather unusual. You'd normally expect a, an exchange to start with spot and then go to derivatives, uh, but that reflects yeah. the licenses you've you've obtained and are looking to obtain in in the future. It, uh, what are the pros and cons of starting with derivatives? Yeah, but I think firstly, derivatives is probably the most complex thing you can start with. Um, you know, trying to uh, establish an exchange with derivatives. Obviously, you've got the, the the obviously you've got to look at the broad range of derivatives. So we we will cover four assets. Uh, so we will do um, calendar futures, perpetuals, as well as options. So we're currently live with uh, calendar futures and perpetuals. Um, the initial reason for that is basically looking at what's, uh, what do you need a license to do and what can you start without a license and what do you need to wait for a license. So um, we took a lot of advice from, from, from lawyers as well as uh, we were speaking to MAS directly. So we felt this is a good way to start the, the, the exchange because it allowed us to get operating quicker. Um, and in the meantime, we applied for all of our licenses. And as, as, I, as I said earlier, some of those have now landed with, with Asia Next. But we, you know, the good thing is we did the difficult thing first. So uh, um, you know, getting that um, live has been, you know, um, you know our, our journey for 2022, 2023. Um, but we've now achieved that, uh, which then has benefits as, as and when we roll out crypto spot and the, as I say, the securities, we can use some of those, uh, that, the benefit of that to support our derivatives venue as well. 
Right. So derivatives have been an eminently practical decision, but you've gained some valuable experience yes. from doing something rather difficult first. Uh, I don't think you did say this, but I think I'm right to say that your initial RMO license is to operate a secondary market only. Um, oh. Good, you're nodding. I've got that right. Uh, mm -hmm. what, are the, what are the advantages and disadvantages of that? Uh, I mean, people would often look to start with a primary market to get some some issues, but maybe there's a big upside to, to running a secondary market first. Well, I think we wanted to be really good at being an exchange. So, um, you know, operating from the point of listing onwards allows us to focus on our core value proposition, which is being, you know, a secondary market for, for, for the listing of these types of assets. There's a lot There's a lot of participants in that space. I mean, there's, um, I don't know the numbers, but there's in excess of 500 CMS license holders for in the primary space in Singapore. Now, we didn't, we didn't want to add to it. And, and within our within the SBI group particularly, we have a lot of uh, value in that space already. So SBI digital markets are in the primary issuance space. And there's many people who want to list these types of products on a venue like ours. So we just felt it's better to start from the point of listing and, and focus on delivering value from there on. Um, and that's really what we've done. And I think that's proved with the amount of interest we've had from various different people who are looking to list on our, our venue. So, you know, all different types of assets, so tokenized diamonds right through to, to, to funds, right through to fixed income, et cetera. So, yeah, it's been, you know, and, we, and we as a venue would be very much tied up trying to, to orchestrate all those different types of listings on the origination stuff ourselves. But there's a long-term plan to develop a, a primary market capability, is there? Um, I don't think so right now. I mean, not 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 at the moment. I think really we want to focus on creating a secondary market for these products. I mean, there's um, there's a lot of people who are in, busy in that space doing the 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 issue of origination. So for ourselves, we we really are really core focused on being a, a really good venue uh, for secondary market. A secondary market will succeed if it. Uh generates liquidity price formation and so on and i see you're working with these market makers uh, b2c2 and and hidden road whose role will be to, to supply that liquidity this is something which is often forgotten these markets don't always happen spontaneously but can you explain to us a, a little bit about what uh, what those two partners will do and how you're going to work with them so um yeah b2c2 is a market maker for on asian x and we have we have other market makers that outside of that such as wintermute and, and and actually a few others which um remain uh you know they want to be confidential to the market so we have to respect that so apology i can't share but the but we have several market makers who, are, who have agreed to make make markets on that um hidden road are um providing kind of more, more uh, represent more of the taker community so they they are there um, the prime broker um are there and they are a, a big supporter of asia next they're really there to bring different types of we're institutional only so they 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 share the same um philosophy on good governance risk of compliance so they bring different types of organizations onto our venue um we on board here where we have a strategic relationship with them so they really help us drive liquidity on, on the platform uh, and make sure that there's a, a good venue uh, available to them for trading. Uh, I mean, mainly crypto at this stage, actually, with them, uh, particularly derivatives at this time. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact you're 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 running a, a secondary market only, you've got a pretty comprehensive list of things you're looking to do. You obviously got to list these these um, assets. You've got to make these trading arrangements we've been talking about b2c2 and hidden road and others you've got to clear them settle them even safe keep them you're going to provide a custody service as well could you could we sort of go through those those services in turn and get an idea of exactly what you're going to be doing now listing i assume is pretty simple it's just secondary listing of of assets which are, happen to be listed elsewhere as well is that right um well so we we, we can list assets which aren't listed elsewhere um so for, I mean, I guess it depends on the way. So if you look at it from a derivatives perspective, what we've done there is really, how can we innovate against those current market participants? So we're a 24 by seven venue. So we, we then offer benefit to the, the market by allowing them to trade over the weekend, uh, which in turn you know, limits your period of risk as an exchange. So the margin period of risk on Asian X is only one hour, which means that you don't have to post as much margin uh, which allows you to be more capital efficient. So 
but for that we've really looked to innovate in that respect um with respect to then the other venues i guess we we offer um yeah, we offer technology which is very you know, secure we we have the we've kind of dropped the the governance risk and compliance mandate from the swiss stock exchange on top of asian x so we really look at how do we how do we protect the industry from the long in, in the long term so really making sure that you know we have the the basis and values that you would see on the swiss stock exchange available on digital digital venue like asian x so uh, when it comes to, to to settlement you know we we take the benefits of um what blockchain can bring so we can settle t0 but but also you know when it comes to the security of the assets so we have, we're a ccp as well so we you know we uh, but um, we also then allow for all the assets to clear and and be secured on Asian X. So we use technologies which people are well used to in this space, like the fire blocks, etc. Making sure that we have really good security on the venue. We run a, a stock a security operations center, etc. So all those kind of elements come together to protect the assets. So we really do focus on you know, the, the life cycle of an asset, basically from from the point of it. I hope that answers your question. It's quite yeah, a bit. Yeah, I'm like, I've got a, a few little few follow ups there, but that, just to I'm clear on that on that trading point, um, you, you mentioned this is a blockchain based platform, so that ability to trade through the weekend and uh, and presumably round the clock with that one hour gap, which you referred to. So, is what's going on here just in technical terms? Uh, are the the the, the the users of the exchange actually transferring value between nodes on a blockchain they operate themselves or are you operating nodes on their behalf how does it work technically that round the clock trading yes yeah, so we're a central exchange right so we're not a de de decentralized venue so everything comes through we operate in the center central limit order book so all counterparties face asian x um what we do is we use the blockchain for settlement and custody of the assets so we use technology like uh such as Hyperledger, uh, Bezu, to uh, on on the blockchain in order to store the assets, but but we yeah you know, we're not distributed, so everybody comes through AsianX. You fa you face us as a separate counterpart. Uh, you mentioned clearing as well, the, the margin call management. Uh, yeah. uh, a does that is that on the blockchain or is it on some different system? And and secondly, what assets are you uh, accepting as margin? Is it cash or are you accepting cryptocurrencies as well? So it's not so we don't margin on chain um just just for speed i think you know we almost the matching engine is not on chain either because of, we take hft you know latency is important on us um for margin for collateral we we largely look at us dollar right so we're fear backed venue right now but we are broadening that at the moment so we're adoption of usdc because you know uh, you know we have great banking relationships but you know, digital fear, I think, is is coming, but it's still got a little way to go. So the the adoption of USDC is really important to us right now. So we're really working on bringing USDC onto the venue in order to allow people to to transfer uh, if, if they need to top up margin accounts at the weekend or after banking hours. USDC is fantastic at doing that. There's also um, there are a lot of adoption now in the space of money market funds. So where you know, capital at rest for an institutional investor is, is not great. So how can we help support them uh, in that respect? And money, you know, you see the issuance of these money market funds coming through now, which you know you mainly treasury backed, um, but they do offer things like interest at five point, you know, up to five percent, you know, on average. Uh, maybe some of them a little bit lower, four percent. Now this this I think is is where the market is going um, because. You can then post that as collateral against your margin position, um, but you can still benefit from earning interest against the the money you know, resting in your margin account. So, you know, as a form of collateral, I think it's a really evolving story. It's a very dynamic space actually right now, um, and you know, we'll look at that. And obviously, when our spot venue is live, can you use you know, uh, you know the physical uh, coin as well to to a margin position? But we're not there yet. But we are definitely there with stable coin. Um, but we, we keep an eye on that space because I feel it's a real, um, it's an innovation that you know, the crypto markets can also bring to, you know, and, and, and all, all this is listed on our on our RMO venue as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes hard to tell the difference between stable coins and, and money market funds, but <laughs> talking of stable coins, you mentioned um, USDC. Is that how 
cash is getting on chain in your model? Is that, is that what you're using to complete the cash leg of settlement? Well, we, you know, we can operate purely in US dollar, um, actually. Um, this is kind of the, the primary use, but obviously the, with the dollar, um, it's still limited to banking hours, right? So um, we prefer US dollar right now. We think it's the most riskless um, form of collateral there is. Uh, but that said, you know, we have to be realize that there are restrictions that are trying to operate 24 by 7. So we have to be open to other types of collateral. So where this is where the USDC, I mean, we our bar is high for adopting stable coins, but the USDC, I think, is one of those stable coins which the, the general industry is very comfortable with. Um, you know, there's an announcement recently, one of our shareholders also a major investor into USDC for the Japan market. So, you know, it's an area that we're comfortable with. Just to be clear on that point, you, you've explained that your preference at this point is to settle in US dollars off chain. But mm, yes. are you saying that if if counterparties were happy to settle in USDC on chain, you would support that? Yes, we will going forward. I, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, we, we touched briefly earlier on, on atomic settlement, and this has been a sort of long running uh, saga mm -hmm. in the securities token space in particular, which people on the one hand say, oh, uh, atomic settlement is a good idea in theory, but it has enormous costs in practice. You have to pre-fund your account. You lose all the benefits of netting. On the other hand, you do get this um, elimination of the, of the counterparty risk. Have you reached a view on where the balance of advantage lies between atomic and non-atomic settlement in your own thinking? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, so, I, you know, I think we are, and I'm not the, I mean, to full disclosure, Dominic, I'm not the best person to answer this, but we're, we're comfortable with the atomic settlement, the pre-funding, is um, not really what institutional want to do, right? Because it ties up too much cap uh, capital. So we, we are working on finding the best balance going forward for that. Um, so we, we are not asking you know, for pre-funding at the moment. So we will, um, I guess that's one of those things that I'll come back to you on, to be honest, because I'll need, uh, we, we're kind of working through that at the moment, how we exactly. Step, exactly I think worse. everybody everybody is working through that question. It's a it's a <laughs> it's an unresolved one yet. Uh, and just before I leave the question of services, could I ask you just to to explain to the listeners clearly how the the blockchain technology you're using works in practice? You've explained that it's being used for for post trade services mm -hmm. only. What is the meeting point between that and and the and the trading side? Um, and and as you look look forward to particularly asset-backed tokens becoming available or some tokenizing i don't know real assets or even securities yeah. listed elsewhere um are those going to somehow be tokenized to a sort of post-trade blockchain and the settlement function will be separated i'm rambling here but perhaps explain to me how how that pre-trade and post-trade functions work together harmoniously on a blockchain sure. Um, so I think blockchain technology, I'm obviously a, a huge supporter of it. Um, when it comes to trading, right, speed is, is important, right? So latency is very important. So we try not, we don't trade, do the matching on chain, right? So we, we do that off chain because it allows us the speed. Now, for and that's really around crypt, crypto um, derivatives, right? So we then none of that sits on chain, actually. The four... Um, security tokens, and we will tokenize uh, securities and that on on chain using Hyperledger Basic, and we will make these digital native uh, listed on the blockchain. We will use, as I said, the the Fireblock technology in order to support those assets going forward uh, in custody. Um, we, I guess, we we use blockchain where it's really of a benefit to the process, right? It's not, you know, it's not the panacea for the world for oils in the financial markets industry. So we we really look carefully at what we can deliver with, with blockchain. So um, one of the things that are important to us is you know, security, um, the future proving of blockchain and interoperability. So they're the things we look at. You know, as I said earlier, we, we have these uh, relationships with uh, SDX in Switzerland and um, Osaka Digital Exchange in Japan. So we want to make sure we can interoperate with, with a, a long-term goal of being able to list in one venue on chain and be able to then transfer that asset into other jurisdictions 
for, so they can be traded in other markets. So we we, we really are on, on the post trade for for um for, for, for this, but, but particularly in the security tokens offering, um, you know, we will tokenize and then we make that asset digitally native on chain. Um, and then obviously it will be it will stay native on, on the chain. I'll come back to that native question and to the interoperability point that you you mentioned there. Before I do, would it make a lot of difference to your uh, operating model if digital cash, digital money, was available on chain now? And by, and by that, I, I I don't mean stable coins. I mean CBDCs. I mean tokenized deposits. Maybe I mean stable coins as well. But is is this a constraint for you in terms of how you can actually operate that this reliable trustworthy digital money is not available on chain and mm -hmm. of course we talk about interoperability but it'd be helpful to have this stuff able to move across border as well by stuff i mean digital money so you could support. yeah no that that would be fantastic <laughs> you know um yeah. so the swiss uh, sdx are now actually um, under david news are the operating whole, wholesale cbdc right against the uh the assets on that venue. So uh, they have a lot of digital bond issuances, some private equity as well. So, so the, the big benefit of CBDC is, right, is, is that you're, you're, it's, the risk is really down to the, the national the national bank. Right? So even if it's you know, um, CBDC, uh, sorry, if it's a tokenized uh, currency on your venue, you still have the, the risk, bankruptcy risk of that venue to, to, to take into consideration. The big benefits of CBDC is that you you really minimize the risk. So we're big big fans of CBDC. Um, it's very early, right? Um, the Swiss are kind of the pioneers in that. What SDX has done with with um, with the Swiss National Bank is is really groundbreaking. They've just done the, the pilot there for that. Um, we would love to be able to do that in in Singapore with um, with with you know CBDC on the same dollar. Um, I mean, I don't even want to go there for US dollar, you know, but 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 it's just not there yet. So then you've got to look at you know for Singapore market what is available to you twenty four by seven, um, and this is where you look at you know it's all about managing risk really what what is available and and some of the banks now the big banks I mean talking tier ones are issuing are, are working on projects to issue digital US dollar um, which can operate then twenty four by seven. Um, this this is really exciting development. I think it's kind of the, the interim step, um, maybe as a alternative to stablecoin. Um, you know, these projects are out there uh, well, well known, and when we're we're speaking to those banks in order to adopt that as and when it's ready, um, it's really a question of they are, they want to operate in a very safe space, like regulated venues such as Asia Next, you know, etc. So CBDC, I guess, is the holy grail. Um, Switzerland the closest right now in 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 my world. Um, we 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 work and speak closely to MAS to understand where they are in their CBDC journey, uh, and likewise in Japan. But I think it's just you've got to have a long term view in this space, and we we do have a ten year view. I mean, my shareholders say that you know, we see you've got to look at this over the next ten years to really see global adoption in this space and. Um, wholesale CBDC is a much easier lift than, uh, you know, like a retail CBDC, which is very political. Um, so we, we we are confident of the use case, but you know it's really out of our hands. It's really got to be driven by the the authority, you know, the monetary authority uh, or the national banks in order to to get that overline. But we, yeah, you know, we've already in in our in our sister exchange SDX have seen the benefits that that brings. We're going to talk about interoperability in a minute, but. Before we do, should we just talk a bit about, about connectivity? You have this relationship with Colt. Perhaps you could explain how that works for you. But more importantly, how are uh, your users going to actually access the Asia Next services? Can they use the traditional routes? How are those routes made secure and so on? How do you reassure them that this is a safe place to go and that what business they do there will be, will be kept secure? So we, we operate uh, with a foot in both camps, right? So we're, we're trying to work with good quality crypto native participants in the institutional space, as well as um, traditional finance who want to, you know, look at an allocation or adoption of digital securities and, and crypto. 
So you, to do that, you've got to be quite versatile in how you allow people to connect into you. So we, you know, the, I mean, it's a heavy lift, but what, what we do is we allow different types of connectivity. So we can, we can operate with, you know, in the traditional world of fix, right? So fixed uh, connectivity is available on, on AsianX, and you can take your market data by things like UDP multicast, which traditional players will know very well. Um, we also then look at things like binary APIs, private links in the cloud, and alongside that, um, you know, the point of presence with Colt, as you already say, which allows you to look at the, if you really want, you know, point of presence in a data center, lower latency environment, that's available. But also on the other side, the crypto natives, they, they use REST. So we, we can connect in those different ways. So it's allowing, you know, from, from our current members, I don't think there's anybody who does it the same, right? We have all these different ways that people look to connect. And, and I think that's really you know, what we bring is that versatility that allows people to say, okay, this is how I have historically done it. And this is how I want to use Asian X. So we, we have a multitude of access points that, that okay. people can connect to. So it's very flexible. You can use fix, you can use APIs, you can use cult, whatever. Uh, yes. And it'd be obviously very useful to have that uh, um, in terms of, of interoperability between exchanges as well. And I'm I'm wondering, this is a, a you know, everybody recognizes that that solving the interoperability problem, getting rid of those constraints would be massively helpful to uh, yeah. digital asset exchanges everywhere. But the blockages to it are, are so varied. You've got all these different blockchain protocols. You've got people operating these legacy systems. Again, we just yeah. talked about connectivity. People want to use their legacy systems. You don't have any standards or don't have any universally accepted standards in the field. And then, of course, you've got all these regulatory differences between the various jurisdictions as well. You've said that you're taking a long-term view, a 10-year view here. Do you think it's going to take that long to get rid of these various barriers to interoperability? Or what, what Have you reached a view on um, how urgent the work is? It, it is a good, that's, a, that's a big question. Um, yeah, I wish I had, the, I had a full answer for you. I think, you know, speaking to big, People who are coming into this space now on the, from the major buy side institutional space, um, I think private blockchain is limited. Like right? obviously you can in, you can interoperate between them, but I, I think you know the Ravi Menon from the MES was talking about global layer one, right? And um, these permission public chains. I think mean, public blockchain is definitely going to have to be the future that we can have a system a chain which is open to everybody, which you can connect to in a safe, secure way. So how, how do you create that environment? And I, um, right now, I think it's, you know, there's the, the iterative steps that the, the industry needs to go through, which is like, where are we today with these private permission blockchains? How can we inter interoperate between them? So, you know, uh, you've got all this different uh, technology evolving, which allows, you know, standards like ERC-20, which allow interoperability. Um, Long term, I do I do agree. You know, with, with Ravi Menon on the the kind of the global layer one will be the foundational for, for big adoption in the industry. I think um, that will be the the prerequisite for it. Um, we we have to operate at the moment in that space where you know that we're not there yet. So how do we help drive the adoption? I think you know it's really understanding what we can do today. How can you add, add versatility? How can you work with that framework? Um, but most importantly, how can you make sure what you do is trusted and people feel secure operating on your network? Because without the, the long-term trust, you know, you, you, you can't afford another 2022 in this space, particularly in the crypto space, because it will erode too much trust. So we're really there about, yeah, we understand the technology is still very new. We're on that journey. I, I do think it's going to be 10 years, actually, until we're really there. But... Um, but we're working towards driving that that adoption, um, and, and you know it's going to be a few steps. I promise to come back to the question of native versus non-native. In this context, I was very interested by a remark which one of your board members, the CEO of SBI Digital Asset Holdings, uh, Fernando Luis Vasquez, said. He said, we're trying to encourage people to leapfrog from legacy technology and go directly to something that's more native digital. Um, I'm happy to declare my view here, which is that the efficiency gains from tokenization ultimately do depend upon uh, going 
native digital. But at the moment, most security token issues and indeed most fund token issues are going down this asset backed route. I'm not asking you to disagree with your, your board member, but again, maybe the relevant question here is, do you agree that with him? Uh, I'm sure you do. But how long do you think it's going to take to get there? And what are the obstacles? Why are people starting with this asset backed model where the efficiency gains are so limited that the business case is hard to make for doing more? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's really about, you know, as you might like say, people have investment in technology. You know, people who sit in major financial institutions have to, to see this technology, you know, through, to, you know, through its life cycle. Um, you can't strip out, you know, you know and, and, and completely adopt a brand new technology overnight. So it's how do you then get to that? I mean, there is no easy answer to this, but the, how do you get to the place where, people can start adopting to the new form, which, you know, when you're fully digital native, there are huge benefits. I think, you know, the efficiency is there, you, um, but it's it's a journey. Um, and what Fernando is saying, I do agree with, is that, you know, you, you have to be realistic about the investment that financial institutions have made in legacy technology. So how can you slowly migrate them over to the, to the new world? I think it will be step by step. Um, some may be able to leapfrog, uh, and get fully digital native straight away, but you need the market to come, right? So to bring liquidity to this, you need you need a quorum, um, and that's going to take a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. Where are these two crucial ideas come together, by which I mean interoperability and native rather than non-native, in my mind came together very well in a, in a paper the BIS published in which they describe the future of digital asset markets as this series of interoperating networks. They described it would function in practice as if it was a single global programmable platform. In other words, you'd be issuing these tokens in a standardized way. They're being, being exchanged in a standardized way as well. Is that a vision which you would support? And again, how far, is, how far away is it? This step-by-step -step process you've described could go on for decades, let alone years. Well, I guess I guess ultimately it's about how can you. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I guess, but the quite the question, I, I, the way that I look at it is, how do we make sure that we can deliver value? Um, if people want to bring new types of assets to market, can the the blockchains which exist operate efficiently and effectively? So, can I transfer value from one chain to another with minimal risk of hacking or exposure? Um, can it then appear across border? Um, and obviously, you've got the regulatory constructs on top of that that we need to consider. And I think, you know, through things like Project Guardian, this is being reviewed as well. Um, so, in my experience, the real world use cases, which are, you know, these are major household, uh, well, financial industry household names, which are adopting this, they are operating on those terms because the, you know, no one has decided which is the global layer one that the whole world will adopt right now. So, the, the realistic approach is to operate, uh, interoperate between chains which are existing um, and make sure that they are, they, they can operate efficiently and safely. That's how we're, you know, how we're working today. In the conversations we have at, at Future of Finance, we tend to find the buy side, by which I mean asset managers, wealth managers, and even end investors, asset owners. They tend to view tokenization much more positively than the sell side, the banks, the brokers, the financial market infrastructures. Uh, in a way, that's not surprising, but it, but is because the buy side has, has most to gain and the sell side has most to lose, if you like. But, but does that match your experience as well? Do you find the buy side more enthusiastic about what you're trying to do than the sell side? I think the buy side, yeah. I, I would agree that the buy side is very enthusiastic in this space. Some of the big names, you know, um, are, are really coming to the fore. Uh, the, yeah, it, this is global news, right? Um, but I would say that the sell side is not um, anti this at all, and it, it, it's actually adopting this. And uh, they may not do it publicly right now, um, but there is there's a load of initiatives going on. Um, big announcements have been made by either in the custody space, but also in on, on the sell side space where they're really looking to do this. Here, um, these announcements are, are really coming through. I think. If, I, if, if 2024 will be the year when we go from, uh, the, it, it's really a will drive adoption. I think by the end of this year, 
there will be a, a marked change in the adoption of this, which will see us go from this kind of nascent phase into kind of the, the start of the growth phase. Um, and that will be driven by, by, by the buy side, the asset managers, but also by the sell side, by the banks. It's, you know, that, that trip, they talk to each other as well, right? I mean, there's these, these relationships don't exist in, in a vacuum. I mean, so the, these companies don't exist in a vacuum. They speak to each other all the time. And we're, we're privy to that being an exchange. At the risk of asking you the same question again, markets are in the, the old cliche driven by, by fear and greed. And the fear here lies in the fear of being disintermediated, the fear of the cost of having to decommission all these legacy systems which you've invested so much money in building and then maintaining. But the greed, of course, is the is the efficiency savings, the cost savings, and of course the massive new business opportunities, particularly in tokenizing all these asset classes, which would benefit from uh being made more accessible and more liquid. Yeah. Uh when you say that 2024 is the year you think we'll move from the nascent phase to the growth phase, does that mean you think we've now in terms of the balance between fear and greed, we're, we're shifting uh, towards greed now. And and if so, does that does that greediness vary between issuers and investors and intermediaries? Or do you think everyone's basically pushing in the same direction? I, I, I mean, I wouldn't use the term greed. I think, you know, I mean, if you're running a, any financial institution, efficiency is going to be Critical and if there, is there a cost benefit, a cost saving to be made? Then banks will look at that, particularly in the post trade arena. I think um, also is that about how do I create opportunity in new new asset types? If, if you look at the Bitcoin ETF, like this is uh, what two two billion inflow now into that bit, uh, the black product alone, uh, which I think is a record for any ETF issuance. Um, but the I think it really is about um, Coming, moving forward in a, in a, in a way that can yeah. You know, how can I can I create can I reduce my cost in the back office? How can I create more opportunities in the front office for me? You know, funding. You know, um, we see a lot of people who are looking to raise capital through tokenization um, in you know, working with other primary issuances, but looking to list. So this is you know, it, it creates more access for more people to the market, which in, in turn is good for everybody. So I, I do see it as a, as a broad benefit. I mean, I mean, you could use the word green, but I think really it's about just access to capital and and, and the benefits that tokenization can bring to to, to a broad range of um, uh, yeah, participants in the financial service industry. Cutting the costs and seizing the opportunities is a good point on which to draw our conversation to a close. Uh, so, Neil Thomas, thanks very much for taking the time to share your knowledge and your experience with the members of Future of Finance. Thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much.